generous, generous introduction. Uh, if you remember nothing of what she said, just remember you're looking at an immensely blessed green kid from the Red Hills of Mississippi. God can do amazing things. I'm a living witness. I'm so happy to be here, and I really was so excited when uh, Ashley Franklin and Elizabeth Weinstein and Mary uh, and Laura Davis told me about this effort. I never thought in my lifetime I would see a location where she said so much history has been made to discuss reconstruction in a judicial way. I got started with this over 50 years ago when I uh, realized that books of reconstruction told a different story than I knew growing up in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. Reconstruction, a glimpse of sunlight before midnight. With that topic, I'm paying homage to W.B. Du Bois, who was the first scholar of the revisionist views of Reconstruction. Uh, I just love saying William Edward Burhardt Du Bois's name. It soothes my soul. And I would urge you to be introduce yourself if you're not familiar with him. We lost him in 1963 in his 90s, and he was on the battlefield from the late 1890s until the 1960s, telling the story. He said he was going to educate himself within an inch of his life if facts and history was what was needed to change the image of Black people. Dr. DeVore said, and I love this comment, that's where I get my title from, the slave went from free to in the sunlight stood, for, stood a brief moment in the sunlight, then moved back again towards slavery. Professor Robin Kelly had an article that that statement and this one by Kelly and the title of Eric Foner's book best summarize what I'm going to say. Robin Kelly in an article in the Louis in the US News and World, World Report after the election of President Obama he said this. Obama is Obama is a political descendant of the first generation of black lawmakers elected during Reconstruction when ex-slaves won the right to vote, hold office in the state houses and assemblies and Congress and help draft the most democratic state constitution in the history of the country, providing free universal public education funds for roads and infrastructure, and services for the poor and the physically disabled. These men, many of whom bore the mark of the slaver's lash, preferred expanding democracy to punishing whites. That's another nugget you can take from what I'm gonna say. And then the last one is Eric Foner's book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished revolution. As Mary has said so very well, in this hall, in this room, is where they voted to succeed because Louisianians and many others wanted to defend slavery. And let me just say this about slavery, and I digress a good bit of doing this speech and whenever I talk. Slavery the enslavement of the African in the Western Hemisphere was the worst form of slavery known to mankind. Slavery has been around since man got a bigger stick than his fellow man and began to subdue him. Slavery was known in Greece. The Greeks enslaved one another. The Romans enslaved one another. Slavery existed in Africa. But it was never a race thing where the race of an individual was synonymous with being a slave. That's give, that gives rise to racism. And I just hope 
that my great, 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 great grandchildren will not be parts of racism and, and it will be in their lives. And we are all scarred by it. Our relatives, our children, our grandchildren, we are all scarred by it. And I can give you many examples. That's a terrible thing, racism. And this is why it was so hard when black people were freed and experienced reconstruction that they experienced the Jim Crow era afterwards. Some would argue that uh, some of the things we see today is just part of pure racism, just unabashed. On every index, when you look at minorities, health, wealth, and every index, they're at the bottom of the barrel. And I will say without contradiction, I don't know if any of your mothers and fathers worked harder than Eddie and Willie Mae Vincent in Mississippi. Worked harder as a student at LSU than I did. But some people just said, look, we got generations of you working hard. I'm gonna take a break. But we need to understand that all people add something to the culture, to the society, to the history of this country. And it's incumbent on us individually to be willing to accept and read about the history of this country. And as Mary said, we're not gonna give you no alternative facts. And if you don't believe me, I have in this presentation, many authors that don't look nothing like me. And I always keep a whole handful of them to give to individuals who said, I question that. So let's begin. And at the end of this talk, I have a little handout. They asked me if I was gonna do a, have a jump drive. And uh, you know, I'm old school, so I have paper. <laughs> so before you leave, <laughs> I hope I have enough copies for you to take with you uh, Alicia has them in, I mean, Ashley has them in the back. So please take one, which will summarize much of what I'm going to say. Okay. There is no e event in the history of African Americans that's more significant than the Civil War and Reconstruction. The Civil War, as my major professor T. Harry Williams said, was a pivotal even in American history. After the war, many things changed in America. You have some 4 million human beings with a claim to freedom that they have fight for as well. And Reconstruction has been so maligned until you almost wouldn't have recognized it from the exhibit they are gonna do going forward from the early accounts of Reconstruction. In the Civil War, Black people were not mere spectators. And this is the case in every war this country has fought. Black people's blood is red and it spilled like others' blood in every war we have fought. At a high, higher percentage in terms of the population, their numbers in the population than others in some of these wars. I often think about World War I, I had a chance to, and I'm digressing just a little bit, to interview some of the people from World War I. And some of these soldiers were lynched in their uniform, coming home. And they did. The American wouldn't even accept them when they was in France, some of them. You don't have to take my word for it. Leon Litwax. I'm going to give you an author that you can check out. If you don't want to check out John Hope Franklin and Benjamin Qualls or Mary Frances Berry or Charles Vincent or John Blassingame, these African-American scholars, I'm going to give you Leon Litwax. Howard Zinn, August Myers, and many others who will verify what I said. So in the Civil War, and at the start of it, Blacks was about 50% of the state's population, and they fought, and Louisiana provided more Black soldiers than any state in the Union. In the total of the Civil War, some 200,000 Blacks fought nationwide. 38,000 lost their lives. In Louisiana, as I said, some 24,000 African-Americans served in the Civil War. And interestingly enough, 
they was kind of on both sides of the war at the start of the Civil War because they were in Louisiana and the Confederate officials were suspicious of their attitudes or what they would do. So they kind of did the okie doke. They went and said, we don't mind fighting for you, not knowing what they might do. But when the Confederates left the state, they did not leave with these Confederate soldiers. And when they participated in parades, they had provided their own arms and rifles. So they did not leave. And as you know, in the Civil War, the plan of the North was to blockade the South from Galveston to Maryland. There was a blockade of the South. And then from the Mississippi River, they was gonna go up the river and cut off Texas from Louisiana and then from Atlanta, go to the Atlantic Ocean from Atlanta, Georgia, Sherman's March, and divide the upper south from the lower south. That was the general strategy of the North. It was called the Anacondia Plan to win the war. So the war starts in April of 1861. So by April of 1862, most of South Louisiana is in Union, the Northern Army's hand. This is why Reconstruction is very complex because Lincoln wanted to try to reunite the Union. President Abraham Lincoln's position on slavery was this. If I can save the Union by freeing every slave, I'll do that. If I can save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I'll do that. My whole objective, and he was a master politician. He's on a penny, looks a different way from the other people on that penny, doesn't he? Uh, his plan was to save the Union. That was his plan. In fact, he's gonna be pushed by Frederick Douglass and others to even enlist black soldiers and make the war one of liberation. In fact, he had to do that to kind of win the war, you see? Okay, so the blacks that participated with the Confederates and their help was forced, the slaves was forced to do fortifications and dig trenches and they did these things to free whites to fight in the war, you see. But when they could, they just flocked to the Union armies once they were in the vicinity. You saw Miss Jane Pittman, didn't you? What did Jane get her name from, according to the great novelist, Ernest Gaines? From a Union soldier who saw her and gave her the name Jane. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, black soldiers more willingly fought for the Union Army were when Benjamin Butler, who was the commander in New Orleans, New Orleans was captured within a year after the war started, April 61, the war starts in South Carolina. April of 62, 1862, New Orleans is captured and Farragut bring his troops up to Mississippi River. He gets as far as Baton Rouge. And when he got here, Baton Rouge looks like it was in a blaze because, you know, as the Confederate Army had to retreat, they didn't want to have resources left for the Union Army. So they burn all the cotton on the docks, pull the molasses out, you see. That's what you do. So these blacks formed Native Guards Union, units rather, Native Guards. They were in the Confederacy, but when the Union Army came with Benjamin Butler, they became part of three regiments of Native Guards. And the Union Army had problems too, thinking that they would fight, you see. Now in the North, uh, in some areas of the North, and I love to depend on the book by uh, Leon Lipwack. We just lost Dr. Lipwack about a year ago. His book entitled North of Slavery. Read it, published in 1961. Leon Litwack, L-I-T-W-A-C-K. He talks about how in the North, black schools was burned, uh, blacks 
who had escaped to the North would be afraid to be returned to the South. So many of them went to Canada. It got so bad in some little cities in the North until, and this is what he says near the end of his book, they would not permit black people to be buried East and West. Some of you who might be in the funeral home business know a little bit about that. Supposedly you bury a person East and West so when they pop up, they should be facing Jerusalem. They permitted, they did not permit certain blacks in certain cities. Check out Leon Lipwax. He doesn't look like Charles Benson now. Okay, he worked at Berkeley for 30 plus years. Didn't even permit them to be buried East and West in some Northern cities, you see. So it was difficult. And these are the scars. I cannot overemphasize the scars of slavery. They are with each and every one of us Black, white, red, or green almost. Okay, and I can illustrate some example of how slavery has impacted us as black people. The system was so pervasive, just so brutal, so dehumanized. You see. So many of these soldiers in the Native Guards fought at Port Hudson. I would invite you to go up to Port Hudson because that's where they was tested on the fire. And they really was used as cannon fodder. There was supposed to be a concerted effort on the fortress there at Port Hudson, but the white soldiers didn't come out of the woods to attack the fort. And the black soldiers had to cross the Mississippi River with their guns over their head, and they became cannon fodder. But according to Nathan P. Banks, who was the commander, they fought splendidly. Two men in particular, he points out, F. Ernest Dumas. One white officer said he has, he was a major, he has more talent than I have as a major, as a major general. That's what was said of him. And then Andrew Kolox, C-A-I-L-L-O-U-X. He was one of these soldiers and in a battle, you know, you're not supposed, you're supposed to charge and you're not supposed to let the flag hit the ground. So if I get shot, Mr. Hughes should run up there and grab the flag and not let it touch the ground. And some of these soldiers kept that in their efforts and in their charge at Port Hudson. That's sacred ground up there, Port Hudson. So blacks participated, not only at Port Hudson, but throughout the South. Uh, whenever they could, they flocked to Union Army camps. They became a problem <laughs> because, you know, there'd be two and 3,000 coming a day into some of these states to wherever they found the Union Army. Now, blacks gained a lot from the Civil War. It, according to James McPherson, and James McPherson is not African-American, he said it brought a revolution in the status of Black North and South. And as he says, over 200,000 fought, and the North probably could not have won the war at all had it not been for the Black soldiers. That's one thing. It brought a change in their status, North and South. It brought freedom. freedom. The war helped dismount the legal process of the peculiar institution. That's what they call slavery. The peculiar institution, Kenneth Stamp, uh, gave it that title. The Emancipation Proclamation would go into force January the 1st, 1863. A Louisiana Supreme Court ruling in October of 1863 that blacks could no longer be held in slavery. In late December of that year, General Banks ordered the removal of all signs in New Orleans regarding the sale and imprisonment of bondsmen. By January the 11th, 1864, the state's constitutional provision regarding slavery were suspended. So that's the change in the status, number one. Number two, the war it meant that Blacks gained educational opportunity. And the way they did it, they would be training for three hours and in camp schools for an hour. So they was able to uh, 
get some education, the American Missionary Association, chaplains in the regiments and other volunteers uh, to help this effort. And this is gonna be the same during reconstruction, that universal public education. It was just like something that they knew would change their status. Thirdly, a sense of black pride developed during the war. They expected and began to demand their rights as men. The bravery exhibited by soldiers at Port Hudson and Milliken Bend in Louisiana and other Fort Wagner uh, in other areas of the country gave them a sense of pride. We must ask for our rights as men. If we are not citizens, why make soldiers of us? And pride was reflected in other ways by these soldiers in the Civil War. Many Blacks began forming and formulating uh, theories about freedoms. They had newspapers in New Orleans, the New Orleans La Union, which would be succeeded by the New Orleans Tribune and then by the Louisianian. And these newspapers would carry stories about Black achievements and Black progress and urging the larger community to abide by their own Declaration of Independence and own Constitution. The Union Command in New Orleans, General Banks supported the conservative forces and the planners. You see, in the Civil War, just like in Reconstruction, there are gonna be two views about what should be done in this unusual turbulent situation. Not all Northerners, nor all Southerners was on the same page about what should be done about black people, about the former slaves, you see. Uh, some did not want to give them full rights. It was a growth and a process of gaining more knowledge by some. But as they began to be start to speak and demand certain things, and Frederick Douglass is one of the great geniuses of that era, geniuses of mankind. Read his narrative of the life of my bondage, and you will learn that Douglas was very observant, and he pushed Lincoln. He urged Lincoln to make the war one of liberation, and Lincoln was, Lincoln was very reluctant, very slow to come to that position. He was a master politician. He wanted to keep the Union together. So Lincoln will be very slow to act on things that Douglas and others were pushing for. The newspapers I indicated had advocated these programs. Uh, they would write letters. They would get their publications in Washington, D.C. before Congress. And the Union Command in New Orleans, uh, and there would be several of those, they would have various views about what could be done about the situation of these former slaves and black soldiers. So Lincoln, as I indicated, wanted to try to get the states back into union as quick as he could. And this is why reconstruction is kind of complicated in Louisiana. It's, it's, it's very interesting because there will be uh, a great discussion, a great debate about how to best get these Southern states back into the Union, you see. Uh, as you know, Lincoln in 1864 was able to get enough people in Louisiana in the southern part of the state, in the southern parishes, to establish a constitution convention. Now, this constitution, Lincoln urged them, said, perhaps you can give the vote to those that are intelligent, the, the persons who had been landowners, those who had some education, you see. 
But when the Constitutional Convention of 1864 ended, it did not grant the right to vote. It left it to the legislature. And the legislature that was elected was by no means going to grant no suffrage to Black people. In, in fact, when they returned to power after the Constitutional Convention of 1864, some of them had their Confederate uniforms on in the legislative halls. And so blacks and liberal-minded whites continued to push for a change of status for black people. In fact, in 1866, nationally, the Republican Party had a majority in Congress that was of like mind. They had Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, Charles Sumners of South of Massachusetts, and other very progressive leadership that said, treat the South like conquered territory. Because when they tried to meet to reopen the Constitutional Convention of 1864, there was a massacre of black people. That's what James Hollingsworth, he's not African-American, we just lost Jim about a couple of years ago, James Hollingsworth Jr. He has an excellent book on Port Hudson. He has one on the riot of 1866 in New Orleans when blacks and liberal-minded whites say, we need to change this constitution and give black people more of a say-so in the government. There was an absolute massacre. Dozens of black people was killed by the New Orleans police. Now this condition of violence is gonna be just throughout reconstruction. Dr. Robinson, it is just hard, I tell you. I had many sleepless nights when you read about the violence, the pure violence that was perpetuated against these elected officials and, and the black community. It was just pure, violence. We're going to talk about Colfax and Cachado and uh, other sites of just outright violence. Dozens of people killed. The same thing in New Orleans. Over 30 some people were killed. Several radical whites or liberal minded white people were killed. In Memphis, Tennessee, the same thing happened. So this caused these Republicans in Congress, the Sumners and the Thaddeus Stevens and Benjamin O. Wade and Davis and others to say, we should treat the South like conquered provinces. Because they haven't changed. The war ends in April of 1865. Lincoln is assassinated a few weeks later. And Andrew Johnson, who becomes president, is more conservative, less amenable to doing the right thing than Abraham Lincoln was. He met Mr. Douglas, and Douglas looked at his face, and he had a scar on his face. He had frowns. And Frederick Douglas said, I don't know what this man might be, but he's no friend to the black man. Andrew Johnson, after the war ended, started granting amnesty to Confederate soldiers. And as the states came back into the Union, they elected former Confederates who came into the legislative halls in Alabama, South Carolina, Louisiana, with their uniforms on in their Confederate gray. They hadn't repented. So what the radicals did or the progressives did was say, we need a new plan. They instituted what we call the Reconstruction Acts of 1867 which divided the South into military districts and put military commanders over the district. Louisiana was in the fifth district along with Texas. And Phil Sheridan, General Phil Sheridan was its commander. And these, com uh, these commanders over these districts was to call new state constitutional conventions and draw up constitutions that was at least more uh, sensible <laughs> than the ones that had been instituted shortly after the war. Now, 
the Constitutional Convention of 1867, 68 in Louisiana had almost an equal number of black and white delegates. That's where I got my start in this whole thing uh, some 50 plus years ago. And in these constitutional conventions, and blacks never were other than Louisiana, and for one term in the South Carolina legislature, were blacks a majority? Although they may be a majority, as in Louisiana, they were 50% of the population. They never had the power that their numbers would dictate. They never had the power from which their numbers would dictate. Louisiana legislatures, throughout Reconstruction, the black membership was about one third. It was right at 40% for one term in the House, but it was about one third, and yet blacks was roughly 50% of the population. Okay. And only one black ever served in Congress during Reconstruction. That was Charles uh, Nash in the 44th Congress. He was from over the Opelousas, he was a carpenter. So these constitutional conventions were held throughout the South in all the Southern states. And these were the most progressive constitutions the states and this country had ever seen. And it was due to the fact that there was blacks there, and then there was whites who knew what to do in terms of the right thing. That Louisiana Constitution Convention of 1867, 68, the Constitution of 1868 that was ratified had a Civil Rights Clause, Article 13. First time that it ever happened. It had the Bill of Rights instituted in it. It disfranchised officers from the Confederacy. And at least four black delegates voted against that. And they said, we wanted everything to always be equal. Once the, legis the Constitution were approved in Washington, then the legislatures began to meet and elect legislators. At the same time, the Constitution were approved and this was the, as John Hope Franklin said, the most revolutionary aspect of Reconstruction. Now, John Hope Franklin was African-American. He was considered the dean of black historians. Uh, when I was his chauffeur, uh, I said, I look at my car and where he sat in my car is the sacred ground almost. Uh, but he said that the entrance of blacks into politics was the most revolutionary aspect of Reconstruction. You know, once anything, black people are connected with it, is revolutionary, is radical, is bad, is less than, okay. But blacks were elected to legislatures throughout the South, and they never were a dominating, corrupt minority. Most of these black men who was elected to position of power in Louisiana were educated. Even the slaves that may have been elected were very shrewd men who sought getting as much education as they could. That is kind of uh, really mind blowing. They was in their mid thirties, or uh, 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 late twenties. And let's see if we can name some of these men who was in the legislature and as delegates. PBS Pinchback was 31 years of age and his pictures out there actually showed me that his picture was up out there with the other governors. That was gonna be the first thing on my speech this evening. That's what we're gonna do, get a, she said we're gonna get a bigger picture of Mr. Pinchback out there. Um, some of these men had been soldiers in the Civil War. Lieutenant C.C. Antoine, who would be one of the three lieutenant governors in Louisiana's history. Okay. Um, Others were Robert Isabella. I, I really like that brother. He was on it. His brother, Thomas Isabel, they was in their late 20s. Emile Detige, J.B. Jordan, E.C. Murphy, Arn Barsenault, William Barry, Oscar Don, Dr. R.I. Cromwell. He was a physician from Virginia. 
Blacks not only became politically astute, but they also continued to educate themselves. Uh, Straight University Law School had uh, students such as PBS Pinchback, Louis A. Uh, Martinet, uh, C. C. Antoine. These men continue to improve and educate themselves. So once they was elected to the legislature, they did the same thing that they did as constitutional convention delegates. And that included voting for universal public education. Until Reconstruction, you didn't really have a a strong public education system in the South because planners were not going to educate people who were not their own family members. You see. In fact, if you look at slavery, slavery oppressed white people. Slavery oppressed the whole society. You see. Uh, and you know that many times the planters sent their sons and daughters to these northern schools like Brown University and Yale and Princeton. And right now, if you go on those campuses, they are doing, and it's a big movement to try to identify some of these areas that they stayed in. Because when they sent their slaves with their sons and daughters, they had a servant. Did you know that? And all of these schools, uh, and Ruth Simmons, Dr. Ruth Simmons at Brown probably has done the most in terms of a look at what these living accommodations were on the campuses for the slaves and their masters. Okay, so, uh, and a good, a good effort on that part is uh, John Hope Franklin's Fleming Lectures at LSU in which he entitles it a Southern Odyssey where he talks about these northerners, these southerners who went north and the northerners fleeced them and how they'd be riding home for money during the summer and when they went up there as students and all of that. It's a, it's a good read. So black people during Reconstruction supported Republican candidates. That's the part of Lincoln because the Republican Party was the ship, all else was the sea. Now, some of you say, well, this is a Republican Party that uh, is taking over in the SCCs, as my good friend, uh, Mr. Engstrom, often talks about on <laughs> Talk Louisiana. Uh, but that's a different party, entirely ideologically different. And that started in the 1930s at the end of Hoover's term when he was trying to appoint some judges in the South that was just races as they could be, and Lynn and Franklin Roosevelt, with the New Deal, black people start switching to the Democratic Party and have kind of remained there because of the New Deal program, the CCC, the WPA, the PWA, FERA, all those alphabet soup programs, and then Harry Truman passes Civil Rights Bill, and then Lyndon Johnson did so much and, you know, obviously what he put into place, as we're going to see right now, is being unrivaled, unraveled, uh, Holden versus uh, Shelby and other Supreme Court cases that's trying to gut the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s. So these black elected officials uh, white and black were progressive men. There was no wholesale corruption, incompetency. They, many of them were self-made men who through perseverance and sometime a bit of luck made their way up to position, up to positions of influence and power. And these delegates to the Constitutional Convention as well as legislate hard. And some of them was, as I indicated, uh, let's look at some of their other ages. Um, C.C. Antoine, an educated free man, was a grocer, barber, and a captain in the Southern Louisiana State Militia. 27-year-old Robert Cromwell was a uh, native of Virginia and medical doctor. Lieutenant 
Julius Massiot had attended college for four years. O.C. Blandon was a 29-year-old grocer in New Orleans. The Isabel brothers, Thomas and Robert, were businessmen in the city. Thomas had a sewing machine show, a store, and Robert was a clerk in Dyer. The Lang brothers from Baton Rouge, Robert and Victor, were youthful businessmen who participated in the Constitutional Convention and uh, Robert later served in the legislation, legislature. Rapides Parish, George Kelso and Samuel Cuny were two men, uh, were both 25 years of age. Charles Tebow of Plaquemin, who had been a delegate, was in his 20s. Young men, some of the ex slaves were people like Dennis Burrell from St. John the Baptist Parish who would be replaced by another slave named Henry Demos. And these men, when you listen to the debate in the legislature, was not out to punish anyone, but wanted everyone to have a right to an education. These Constitution Convention makers and delegates, uh, many of them were family men. Henry Demas had one child. He was a family man. C.C. Antoine was married and father of three children. William Harper was married with one child. ex slave Dave Young had one child and was married. So these men, black and white, were family men for the most part and progressive individuals. Progressive. And when you look at the Constitution and the laws that they passed, for example, in Louisiana during Reconstruction, you had on the books five civil rights bills. They had a law and they had an exemplary clause where the owner, if he discriminated, could cause you personal harm, would have to pay for that, just like what we have now with injuries and things of that nature. Dr. Du Bois says, these constitutions and laws were so wise and so well suited to the needs of the New South that in spite of the retrogressive movement following the removal of blacks from office, much of this legislation still stands on the statute books. Although the Louisiana Constitution of 1868 lasted nine years, the Constitution that was adopted in 1879 had and retained some of the same provision. Blacks was enthusiastic about voting, and they voted in record numbers. They were enthusiastic about voting. Civil rights laws, as I indicated, were strongly favored by these individuals. And uh, as legislators, J. Henry Birch of Baton Rouge was the war school's most outstanding supporter in the legislature. D John Henry Birch from East Baton Rouge Parish supported LSU to the hilt. He was a black man. And as you know, Southern University emerges out of the 1879 Constitution Convention. And that was when black people was on their way out of power and PBS Pinchback wanted to put something in law that he hoped would continue to exist. You can see the vision of these men. Look at what one of them said, Pinchback says, about integration and civil rights. Pinchback said in 1869, when they said that all you want to do is mess up our system, Pinchback says, I consider myself just as far above coming into an elevation with them, whites. I do not believe that any sensible colored man upon the floor would wish to be in a private part, a public place, without the consent of the owner of it. It is false. It is a wholesale falsehood to say that we wish to force ourselves upon white people. That's what PBS Pinchback said in 
1869. And as you know, during Reconstruction, Pinchback would be elected as a United States Senator from Louisiana, but he was denied that seat, but they still paid him $16,666, the, the amount he would have received had he served. Other issues addressed by black legislators were the right of laborers on plantation, non-discriminatory privileges and provision on rights given to railroad construction companies, incorporation of towns, relief appropriation, legislation funding for white and black institutions of higher learning, legitimatizing children born of slave unions, a strict definition of vagrant, internal improvement measure, ferry privileges for uh, themselves and others, tax measure, better oversight of charitable institutions, and larger funding for prison, deaf, dumb, and insane asylum. It would be their knowledge that the recognition of our special kids receives some great attention. And we're still grappling with that now. Now, Blacks in executive position uh, was very interesting men. We had a Black who was Secretary of State, Pierre George Deslon from Iverville Parish. We had a Black who was Superintendent of Education, William G. Brown. And my favorite one is the Black Treasurer a free man of color who was a slave owner in 1860. He was the richest man of his class in 1860, had a big plantation in Iberville Parish. His name was Antoine Duperclay. Duperclay was state treasurer for 10 years during Reconstruction, from 1868 to 1878. 10 years. And when he left office, his Democratic opponent came in and went over the record book and they found not one penny missing, not one penny missing. Now his successor was a carpetbagger who was not African-American from Kentucky, E.A. Burke. He stole $1.2 million, left the state, bought a big plantation down in Nicaragua, never returned, and Dolores, none of the money came back either. And if you want to look at that, we have an article in the Journal of Negro History, 1981. I was fascinated by him. Now, these men suffered and their lives was in danger, always. And let's look at some of those that was killed. Joseph Leo Fisher was elected from East Baton Rouge Parish, but was killed by a mob on election night. A Massachusetts educated free man of color in Monroe. Francis St. Clair was killed while returning from a speaking engagement in Morehouse Parish. He was, a, he was a candidate for state representative. The man who killed him went scot-free. In October of 1875, John Guerra was taken from a sheriff, from sheriff officers and killed while being transported from East Felician Parish to Baton Rouge. A family man helplessly watched Claiborne Parish, former Constitution Convention delegate William Matters murdered in his backyard. Not only do you have these individual cases, but you have, as I indicated, just wholesale violence, massacre. St. Landry Parish, 1869, dozens of blacks was killed. Violence in general in Bossier Parish, 1868, the sheriff and parish judge stabbed and murdered in Franklin's St. Mary's Parish. October of 1868, a riot in St. Bernard Parish. Blacks was killed by a racist group called the Innocents. In New Orleans, Blacks were removed from the police force. Northern whites and President Johnson was fearful of sending in the militia of putting arms in the hands of Blacks. In Colfax, Easter Sunday, April the 13th, 1873, in Grant Parish, over 150 blacks was killed. And you may have seen in the news where Governor John Bell Edwards, bless his heart, has done a good job of going around, as has Mr. Nungesser, Lieutenant Governor, 
in terms of trying to recognize these missing pages from history. You may have seen the fact that Mr. Edwards went up to Colfax in Grant Parish recently and took down that monument, which was a lie, and replaced the more accurate picture. And you saw that on television? And he talked to some of the descendants on both sides. The best book on that, two of them. Leanna Keith, K-E-I-T-H. Leanna Keith, entitled Colfax Massacre. And another one by Charles Lang, L-A-N-E. These are not African-American. Read their history and your toenails will curl up on your toes. Uh, other incidents in Cushado, in Denver Parish, blacks was killed and hanged. Other incidents like Red River Parish, you had incidents of that. Uh, now in that Colfax incident, over 97 people were indicted and they raised money. Sounds familiar? Uh, 240 to try to get them out of their predicament. And the 240 witnesses was there to certify. And they con convoluted it so until nothing happened to these men. The su Supreme Court decision of 1873 in the Slaughterhouse case ruling power of Congress does not extend to the passage of laws for the suppression of ordinary crimes within the state. See that? They twisted the law that says Congress can't do anything, the federal government can't do anything about this violence. It's a state affair, you see. And the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, a man named Waits was the one who wrote the decision in the U.S. versus Crankshaft case. Chief Justice Morris Waits in 1875, he ruled that states could protect rights of voters only not the federal government. This is why we had the civil rights movement of the 60s. We had to get the federal government involved and some of that is being rolled back. And you see as it's being rolled back what some of our fellow states are doing. So violence would be a big part of the effort of the midnight experience of reconstruction. So as I hasten to close, let's see what were some of the benefits of reconstruction. Obstacles with many, as we've said. Some of these achievements are freedom meant many things, and especially an opportunity to claim loved ones and families. And if you go into the courthouses, you'll see where that marriage was just off the charts. As black people, it's difficult to trace your ancestry back because when you get to the plantation, you're going to have black people with first names only. I, saw, I hope some of you are watching Henry Louis Gates' uh, program on ancestry. And then when I've looked at many of those census records, then when you get to 1870, you find all these black people with last names. And with children, they will put them in school. And wives, housewives, they try to get their wives out of the field and into the house and get their children into some kind of educational system. It was amazing when you look at those records. So that was one, one benefit of Reconstruction. They could claim loved ones and family. Marriages among Blacks, more the rule than the exception. John Blass and Game on Black New Orleans find that 78% of the Black families in New Orleans were uh, headed by men in 1880. Uh, educationally, Black gained many efforts during Reconstruction. You had schools established like Strait, Leland, and New Orleans University that offered high, they offered a little bit more than high school education, you see. The American Missionary Association uh, was instrumental. And another thing was black began to develop their own churches, Baptist and Methodist and Episcopalian. And the Methodists acquired more membership than any of these religious groups. Intellectually, black had La Chanel, they had a number of newspapers, uh, not only the ones we mentioned in New Orleans, but you had black newspapers like the Concordia Eagle, the Grand Era in Baton Rouge, the Lafourche Times and New Pioneer in Iberville Parish. These are black newspapers, the Point Capi Republicans. They may have been short-lived, but it showed that they was about doing the things 
that would make them a whole community. And then C. Van Woodworth, late great professor, says that many Northern radicals were more interested in keeping Blacks in the South than in, than in protecting them and making their citizenship secure. It appeared then that Blacks had to maximize their efforts towards gaining recognition of their rights, which left little time for other activities. And the other thing that uh, we talk about this 40 acres and a mule, there was no 40 acres and a mule. No, indeed. That was a proposal by some of the Union commanders in the Carolinas, Sherman, William T. Sherman, who was, as you know, was a president of LSU. You do know that, huh? His first president, president of LSU. Say what? The first president of LSU. First president. And if you go and look at some of the old documents, in this, when I was doing research, he's, he signed them. So Sherman proposed that. But the that never occurred. And if they acquired property, it was taken from them. The plantation system, according to Roger Shugg's, extended and overcame reconstruction. In other words, those who owned the land in 1860 owned the land in 1880. There was no great exchange of land. And some black people realized that in the established cities like Bayou, Mississippi, where they bought land as groups. Yes. So it was a difficult situation. And lastly, Kenneth Stam said, if nothing else, we got out of Reconstruction, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, yes. which was chipped away at and were never quite enforced as often as they were. Uh, one of your senators who served for 30 years as a senator, he proposed abolishing the 15th Amendment every year he was in Congress. And that would be? Allen Allen. Thank you. Yes. I don't want to cut yes. Dr. So Vincent off because yes. we could be here for, we gave him an impossible task. We said, talk about reconstruction in an hour and we could be here days from now. Yes. But please join me in thanking Dr. Vincent. And we're going to take a couple of questions because this was an awesome, awesome presentation. And we do have some questions. So if you would hold on just a second, Dr. Vincent. Yes, please. Hello, thank you. First of all, Dr. Vincent, thank you for being here. And I enjoyed the presentation. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I have a two part question um, or two questions. The first relates to the fact that Abraham Lincoln's primary goal was preservation of the union, which I understand and respect. And he would have done that. If now, it meant, say that again. Um, just affirming President Lincoln's goal of preservation of the Union, whether or not that meant um, freeing every slave or, or keeping every slave enslaved. But what I don't know and what I'd like you to um, guide me to is about the state, the, the slaves who weren't freed. There was something in between. He freed some, he freed most, and, and that's why. In another state, I wouldn't mention it, but since we're here, yes. there were 13 parishes in which the slaves were not free. That's right. And I can understand Orleans because you had a large free population in um, Legion de Colère Libre, but the other 12 parishes, I'm like, why don't we see more about that? Why don't we hear more about that? And for those of us who are interested in that, where can we find that information? Okay. Uh, one of the best and most judicial books is by my good friend. He's the late uh, Professor Joe Gray Taylor. A book entitled Louisiana Reconstructed. Joe Gray Taylor, LSU Press Publication, 1974. And obviously uh, works by John Hope Franklin. Uh, From Slavery to Freedom, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Franklin's book on Reconstruction. That's you, and that's an excellent point you raised. Thank you for that question. Because if you look at the Emancipation Proclamation, it exempts certain parishes. It did not apply to the areas that was controlled by the Union Army, 
the southern part of the parish state. It did not free the slaves in West Virginia, Jones County, Mississippi. <laughs> there was some areas that succeeded from succession. Jones County, Mississippi is one of those areas. So it, did, it just applied to slaves in the areas in rebellion. It's a fascinating topic that I am just like, how is this just glossed over? And then, and thank you for those resources. My second question is related to um, the first black governor of our state. Um, PBS Pinchback is credited with being the first black governor and I'm down with it, I'm all for it. I'll tell everybody until um, the state of Virginia again, Douglas Wilder, almost a hundred years later in 1989. That's right. But my question, my personal question is, how did we get to PBS Pinchback being credited as being the first governor when Oscar Dunn was elected lieutenant governor prior okay. to PBS Pinchback? And he also served as governor, acting governor. Um, Oscar wow. Dunn was, well, Governor Weymouth, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I can and say Henry Walmart. Clay. Warmoth, okay, was away. And then he was impeached for PBS Pinchback. So if that made any difference, because Dunn was in office in the governorship for 39 days versus 34. You've been Thank reading you. Mitchell's book on that monumental, huh? I just read. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but she mentioned the book by, uh, I can't think of Mitchell's first name, has a book entitled Monumental on Oscar Dunn. And it's an interesting book because it has the kind of uh, cartoonish type efforts that great artists, three of them did that book. And he makes that point very well. Uh, and you know how Pinchback got to be Lieutenant Governor after Don's death, he was Speaker Pro Tem, so he was elevated by the legislature to be Lieutenant Governor. And then the Governor Henry C. Warmer, uh, uh, individual who bumped heads. The, you know, that's why when you look at Reconstruction, there were so many competing views of what should be done. Henry C. Warmoth was impeached because he tried to veto the civil rights bill. And, and uh, at the end of the war, he got a big plantation down here in Plaquemine Parish. And, uh, and when that Moral Act was passed, then he tried to get more money for uh, our institution, some of our institution, then others of our institution. Very interesting. Uh, but yes, uh, Pinchback is very interesting, very interesting individual. Uh, First off, I I didn't hear who the senator was that tried. Say it again. Oh, Allender. Okay. Oh, Alan Allender. Okay. And in 1972, at his death, Richard Nixon was on the tarmac in Thibodeau. I wow. never forget it. And every year he was in the Senate, he tried to repeal the 15th Amendment. It's interesting. So now the next thing is, how do we as individuals, how do we as individuals, both black and white, prevent people from trying to rewrite history? Yes, that, that's an excellent question. And it troubles Today, me. Today, yes. It really troubles me. And it's on us to try to do all we can. And this is why I always have a slew of and a list of authors who don't look like me because you know when, when black people started writing their history, Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, when he started, they said that you are too sensitive to write your history, you see. And right now, I thank God for many of the authors who are black and white, who are writing very judicial history. And they are turning out these books right and left, for Dr. Robinson. So it's incumbent upon us to elect published officials and local, state, nationwide, who read your history and say, I'm not just gonna go with this foolishness. Because let me say this, when you think about uh, black inventors, did any of you go through a red light come in here? Did you know you had stopped when it was red and green? That's an invention of Garrett Morgan. Have you have had loved ones, a black man, who have had a blood transfusion Charles Drew, look at that, check me out. The defibrillator, you got any loved one with defibrillators? It was Dr. Watkins, a black man who helped develop that. Now just think, if they do these 
these things under these unbelievable circumstances. Just think, if we educate everyone, we wouldn't have to worry about heart disease, diabetes, cancer. You know, you're cutting your own throat when you don't say, let's educate everybody. Let's not go along with this foolishness. Thank you. I mean to tell you every time I think about it, white and black doctors, I don't want white and black kids. I want to go as high as they can, help me as much as they can, you see? So we have to just continue to get involved, you see? Talking about wokeism, wokeism. And some of these individuals went to some of the best schools in the country. Oh, we thought they, I mean, I'm rethinking. I spent a summer at Harvard and it was transformative for me. At the Widener's Library, you go there, you up in the Harvard, the Widener's Library, go down as deep as it goes up. Books everywhere. And then these people graduate from these schools. You take your arm and leg to get into the school. Then you come out seeking power, seeking power. And I'm preaching now, but you know, I've been to many funerals. My wife and my lovely wife is sitting there and she says, shut up. Uh, I've been to many funerals. I have yet to see more than one body in that casket. I've been to one or two where they had a child in there, a glove or a baseball. I told my kids, I didn't see my son, he told me he was coming tonight. Uh, I told him to slip a book under my pillow. But we have to die for ourselves. And eternity is too long. <laughs> and according to my Bible, if you don't get it right <laughs> during this phase, you know, you can't get it right later on. So just treat everyone right. Dr. King said hatred is too big a burden to bear. We have two more questions, one yeah. over here and then one over okay. here. Okay. I just want I want to give a shout out to WRKF. Uh, there was a, a, a program today uh, on, um, on, and I'm going to mess up the, the title, but it was like Black AF History. Um, and uh, it, it did make the same point that you were making, that, that uh, history is written by the white people for the white people. And it glosses over all the, all the contributions of, of uh, black inventors and black historians. And so I appreciate everything. Yes, thank you for that. Hold on one more, and then this is going to close us out. And then we have a fabulous book that uh, Dr. Vincent has written that we want to, oops. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Hold on. I'm going back. Okay. Hold on. I'm going back. Okay. I'm sorry. Look at my, my scholar here. Thank I'm you. on a, don't look at her and uh, ask her a question. Go right ahead. How are you doing? <laughs> Fine, Braille. Charles. Thank you. Oh. Today, we are fighting for reparations, but weren't white slave owners paid for the slaves that they lost during the Civil War? Uh, I don't know if they was paid as such because these laws eliminated that. But I do know that in the American Revolution, those slaves that fought with the uh, British and went back they ended up compensating them to some of their funds. I don't know if any slave owners were uh, compensated as such. Because now, had you not had people in Washington and some of these black and white legislators putting laws in the books that that wouldn't occur, they would have certainly probably tried to get that. But I'm not familiar with any of them uh, getting compensated for their slaves. And the same thing with whites, blacks that may have owned slaves. You know, you had black slave owners, yeah. okay? Now, John Hope Franklin said this was due to the fact that some of these slaves had to be, in some states, had to have owners to just survive. And they may have been relatives that they were saying were slaves because it was very difficult and I believe some of them had them for just the same reason that anybody else. It was a profitable business, you see. If you was dealing in the black, why do we call it, uh, look at how we use our, our laws now. If you're in the red, now this is from Joe Gray Taylor, book on slavery. If your business is in the red, is it profitable? Now that comes from, according to Joe Gray Taylor, Indian slavery. 
if your business is in the black, is it profitable? Is it profitable? That's because you're dealing in black slaves. Yes, indeed. We yeah. One last question. I would like to get some clarity with regard to the first question that was asked. Um, with regard to Mr. served as the first uh, governor, but was not accredited with that. And Mr. Pinchback, who is credited as the first governor of Louisiana, would the difference be that Mr. Dunn was appointed and Mr. Pinchback was ele was actually elected? No, Pinch Pinchback was kind of elevated by the legislature to that position. And we have at least 10 laws that he signed. I don't know if we have any laws that Don signed when the governor was out of pocket, you know. Uh, I don't think Mitchell, uh, some of you who have read Mitchell's book, I don't think he mentioned any that was signed by Oscar Don, who was a very honest man, a mason, a family man. And his widower was uh, married John Henry Birch, who was a senator from East Baton Rouge Parish. Wow. I want you all to join me in thanking Dr. Vincent for being here tonight. This was a wonderful program. I thank everybody who participated. And if you would be interested in a copy of Dr. Vincent's book, please step up here. There's also a handout on your way out that cites a lot of the references that Dr. Vincent mentioned yeah. tonight. So yeah. thank you all. Please come back and visit yeah. us. Thank you. And Call me and let me know how much I got wrong. And I'm, I have a notepad to put it down and I'll check it out. And, and these are at the cost that they cost me. The book is for sale. Yes, indeed. So step over here and Dr. Vincent will help you with this. <laughs>